Hello, everyone, and welcome to another year of summer reading programs. This webinar is brought to you courtesy of the Mississippi Library Commission. My name is Brooke Bourgeois. I am a Youth Services Coordinator for the Hancock County Library System. I'm very excited to be here with you all today. We are here to discuss children's K through five programming for the 2024 CSLP theme, Adventure Begins at Your Library. And I love this theme because adventure is not only travel or around the world, there's a lot of outdoors and camping, but it's also a great time for you to showcase what your library has to, to offer. Adventure begins at your library. So what things do you have that you can showcase to your community, things that they can come in and do with what they have to offer? <clears throat> so before we start a little bit about me, I have been with the Hancock County Library System for three years. I am a youth services coordinator for the Bay St. Louis branch. I'm very grateful for the teams that I'm a part of here, the support throughout the whole system, my fellow youth services colleagues, and the team I work with every day here in Bay St. Louis. I also manage our library TikTok account. You should check us out if you are interested. And I love reading, music, and my dogs. So today's discussion, we will be talking about the main goals of CSLP, some backup plans, inclusion and accessibility, as well as some ideas for decorating, displays, programming, and book lists. And my email is at the end. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. So the main goals of CSLP, why do we do this, what we do every summer? First off, you want to motivate reading outside of a school setting. These kids are used to 10 months of thinking that reading is for test scores and grades and that kind of thing. And you're kind of hoping to inspire a lifelong love of reading for some of them. And maybe they enjoy, they learn to enjoy some form of books or they find books that they do like to read. You're also going to reinforce educational and creative habits. We're all familiar with the summer slide, which is the regression that kids make in autumn when they come back to school and teachers kind of have to reteach some of the things that they learned the last year because they spend two months not doing things that are pushing them or testing them and they kind of lose some of what they learned in school. So you wanna reinforce some habits in them. You want to encourage them to learn something over the summer and kind of keep their brains moving. You are also giving your library the opportunity to promote programs, materials, and services. This is a great time to showcase all this stuff to your community. Maybe you have a makerspace or a library of things, or you wanna showcase a specific part of your book collection. Whatever it is, this is a great time. You generally get people in during the summertime who don't come throughout the rest of the year. So it's a great way to just showcase what your library has to offer. And you're also providing families with activities, experiences, and learning opportunities. Most of us, I think, have at least one good memory of coming to the library for a summer reading program as a kid. And now we get to do that for the next generation, which is very special. So we're going to talk about some backup plans. Ultimately, something will go wrong somewhere. You don't want it to. It's always good to have some things in the back of your mind that you could do, um, whether a speaker cancels at the last minute or something doesn't get sent in through the mail in time. You ordered something too late. So it's nice to have these things kind of in the back of your mind, things that you can do or throw together very quickly that don't take a lot of effort and you know you always have them if you ever need to. So you have some quickly assembled programs, something as simple as a movie and a craft or coloring sheets. That's something that you can do the day of a program if somebody were to cancel. You can grab a movie off your shelf and then print out some coloring sheets and you're good. You still have a program to put on. You can also use some leftover crafts for a crafter noon type program. Most of us have at least a couple leftover crafts sitting in a cabinet, or like four or five of some things that you could put out on a table and let them pick a craft that they want to make. <clears throat> if you don't necessarily have leftover crafts, ask yourself what supplies you have that can be pulled into a craft very quickly. Another idea is doing community cards. 
This really just takes construction paper, markers, and crayons, and you would provide materials and let them make cards and choose where they would go. If it's going to a local nursing home, a hospital, doctor's office, or a fire station, that kind of thing. And this is a, this is a great low cost, low effort, and they'll still get something out of it. They're doing something for others. And it's a great program that you can pull together with things that you already have. Another backup plan that you could have, this is something you could have all year round, just kind of sitting in the back of your closet that you know is there for in case anything ever goes wrong. You could have a story time in a box. Whether you pick one or two books, whether or not they're in your catalog or not, if they're books that are in your catalog and stay on the shelf, maybe it's a general theme and you know you'll always have like two Dr. Seuss books or you know you'll always have two books about dinosaurs or space or whatever you have, or if you just have two books that aren't cataloged that live in this box with the rest of these activities. You could include a game or activity that goes with that theme as well as conversation topics. So this age group is a good group where you can start talking about different aspects of a book with them and they probably have a good conversation with you. So you could have all of that kind of pre-prepared and put in a box with a craft or maybe a couple coloring sheets, something that you can just take and go however you need to. <clears throat> and it's, it's just a great thing to have on hand. Something else you can make with what you potentially already have in your library is a popsicle stick harmonica, and I've included the instructions on how to do it in the resources. All you need is two popsicle sticks, two rubber bands, a strip of paper that is the same size as your popsicle sticks, and a toothpick, and you layer the toothpick with the paper inside of the popsicle stick, and you wrap it with rubber bands, and you've made a harmonica, and this is something you can make with them. They'll learn how to do it. They probably have these items at home as well, and you'll teach them how they can make something like this. You could even play along with them, maybe put a song up on the board for you guys to play, and you haven't had to go out and buy anything more more than likely you have this stuff already so it's a great thing that you could pull together at the last minute and just as a reminder with this age group this is k through five so you're working with ages roughly five to eleven they're gonna get antsy they're gonna lose focus that's okay you want to provide them with opportunities to take a break you don't want it to feel like school for them they have to sit and listen and be quiet they want to move around so we've got a couple break ideas here for you there are some movement ideas whether it's just standing up and stretching really quickly or if you have some foam dice or something you can roll an exercise dice and if it lands on jumping jacks everybody stands up and does a couple jumping jacks if they can uh, you can also create a balance beam out of tape at the back of your room and just let them kind of take turns walking across this age group is super competitive and i think you'll find that they're going to want to see who can walk it the best especially if you do different patterns like zigzags or swirls or that kind of thing and if you're not familiar with brain breaks on YouTube, teachers really love these. These are videos that you can pull up and put on the projector. Um, and they basically simulate different things, whether it's Jurassic Chase, Minecraft Run. They would run in place and it acts like they are running from a dinosaur or that kind of thing. And they really love it. It gets them engaged. It gets their blood flowing again, kind of gets their laughs out, and they'll maybe calm down for the rest of your program. And we have a couple icebreakers as, as well. With this age group, they might be very uncomfortable if they don't know some of the kids around them. They may not feel like they can talk if they feel like they're strangers. So icebreakers are just a really good way to get them more comfortable and kind of talking and get them to think a little creatively. You can ask them a basic question like, what's the last book you read? Or um, if you could have any pet, what would, you, what would it, it be? And somebody might answer dog or cat, and you're also going to get that kid that says dragon, which is a great answer. And then this manual, this theme has a lot of really good would you rather type question ideas. So, you know, would you rather 
go on a hike or a hot air balloon ride or would you rather go to the beach or to the mountains? There's so much adventure based would you rather questions you could do. And if you have, you know, a big piece of poster paper where you can write would you rather questions, you could give them stickers or tally marks, let them vote on the answers, that kind of thing. It's something just a fun way to get them thinking prompt questions like what would you do if you woke up as Bigfoot and let them answer. It's just a fun way to get them kind of talking and thinking and just make the room a little bit more comforting for them. And then some games you can do. Some of these you will find on the Google desktop homepage. You don't necessarily have to go there. You can find most of these anywhere. Guess the animal sound. You could click on the animal. It'll play a sound. You have to guess what that animal is. My coworkers and I play this all the time. It's very fun. You can also do a memory game. These are all on, like I said, the Google homepage that you don't necessarily have to use that one. Emoji Kitchen is one that this age group loves. It shows the full range of appropriate emojis and you can click on any two and it'll combine it into an entirely new emoji. So they love picking out different ones and seeing what it makes. And it's a very fun way to just kind of get them laughing and talking about different things. Um, it's a great way to kind of encourage them to work together as well. Next, we have inclusion and accessibility. This is very important for libraries to just kind of keep in mind as they make programs. I've included the checklist for inclusion and accessibility that is from the manual for CSLP. It also includes a lot of really good resources for further readings if you're interested in that kind of thing. So some things to keep in mind for inclusion is that you want to include diverse representation in your collection. That means not just backgrounds that represent your community, but you know things that they may not be as familiar with. You wanna include as many diverse cultures and backgrounds and different lifestyles as you possibly can. You want to include everybody. And uh, your collection is really where that starts. So you wanna be mindful of the books that you have on display. If everybody is showcased, if every kid can see themselves in those books. You also want to avoid catering to stereotypes or creating gender divides. Words like you throw like a girl or boys don't cry, that kind of thing really creates a barrier and it pits them against each other. And if you kind of delete those words from your vocabulary and set the neutral playing ground, you'll find that there's less reasons to divide them or kind of create those stereotypes. You also want to pay special attention to names and words in other languages. Do your best to pronounce them correctly. If you mess up, it's okay. The important thing is that you're trying. Google is a great way to kind of look up a word and see how it can be pronounced, practicing saying it out loud. What you don't want to do is say, your name is too hard, I'm going to give you a nickname. But you want to actively try your best and don't stress yourself out if you mess up. We're all doing our very best. And generally just using inclusive language. Where is your grown up versus where is your mom kind of thing. We all know working in these programs that not every child necessarily comes in with their mom or even has a mom. So using an inclusive language that doesn't leave anybody out is just a very great way to start. Next, we have accessibility. So you always want to presume competence of people of all abilities. And what that means is it draws on the idea that the barrier to participation is on the environment and not the person. So you want to ask yourself if the environment you have provided is as accessible as you can possibly make it. Is the program site easy to access with a wheelchair? If it's something that's outside, is there a wheelchair ramp nearby? Um, if it was raining the previous day and there's mud, could a wheelchair user still be able to get there? You kind of want to have these questions in the back of your mind and so you know how to answer them or you know how to go about this so that nobody is excluded, as well as providing multiple seating options and providing ways for as many different kinds of people as possible to come in and enjoy your program. And then as always, if you're using any kind of flashing lights or loud content, that kind of thing, you need to provide a an advanced warning. That way everybody is able to participate and you're not going to set off any kind of triggers or anything like that. 
And just remember, it is very easy to present these in a very natural way. You don't have to get to in your head and think that if you mess up, it's going to go terribly wrong. We're all human and we're all learning and you're doing your very best. And that's what's important is that you're actively trying. And you have to remember that libraries are for everyone and that progress starts with you. And doing these simple things really will add up to a very inclusive, welcoming, warm environment that you're creating in your library. Next, we have decorating and displays. Here's just a couple ideas. If you weren't really sure where to go with this theme or you thought it was too broad, I've put together a couple ideas. You wanna think about travel or camping and outdoor activities. Travel-wise, you could do a very cute luggage display, different cases of luggage or a, you know, a suitcase with books coming out of it. Camping and outdoor types of activities uh, displays with books, things you can do outdoors, like hiking or bird watching, that kind of thing. That's a great way to tie in any outdoor based books that you have. And then choose your own adventure. We all typically have a great collection of choose your own adventure because kids between the ages of five to 11 really love picking their own stories. So this is a great way to kind of put them all together and have a great choose your own adventure display. It goes with this theme fantastically. In terms of decorating, I think a camping reading corner is so cute. I can already see the taglines of camp read some more popping up. I think it's adorable to do a little fire pit type of area or anything outdoor related like that. You can also do an I spy case with different outdoor activities, um, you know, a telescope or binoculars, that kind of thing, as well as different sports, a football, any kind of outdoorsy activities, whether you put them in a case or a bulletin board, um, an I spy thing is always great. And there's different ways you can tie the theme into it. If you include trees or maybe like a Where's Waldo type with a Bigfoot, that type of thing. And then tying back adventure into actual books, you know, the signposts are always very cute for the different worlds you travel when you read, whether that's Narnia or Oz or Wonderland. And you can really do that with a lot of age groups in the different countries. You can do signposts in adult fiction, you know, with the different popular worlds and countries and that kind of thing. So it's something that you could do throughout the whole library and it could turn out very charming. Next, we have some program ideas here. These, some of them come straight out of the manual. Some are ones that we've put together that we are potentially doing here at Hancock County. So to start, we have constellation jars. This is a resource I've provided as well for how to make them, but you can tie it in with like a steam talk about astronomy or a folklore based uh, stories of the stars or what early settlers thought of stars, you know, there's different ways you could take this program and teach them something and let them make something as well. So there's a lot of really fun ways to do constellation jars. You can also do time capsules. The manual provides a prompt for a basic time capsule questions for kids, you know, in 2024, this is my favorite book, movie, food, that kind of thing. So you could provide them with materials to make their own time capsules different magazine cutouts or items that they can include. This is also a great way to get your community involved and you know do a library time capsule where you invite members of the community to put in something, whether you put it out, you know, will be opened in five, 10, 15 years, however you choose to do it. This is a great way to involve your entire community in doing a time capsule together and potentially having something to unveil years down the line. It's a great way to tie in your community and doing things together. Then you could do a pen pal with another library. This is actually something we're doing here. Um, like I said, I'm from Hancock County Library System. That's the southernmost county in Mississippi. And I have a contact in Tupelo. So we are going to do a pen pal program with the Lee County Library System. And you could do a library in Mississippi 
Or if your research skills are particularly good, you could pick one in another state and see if somebody's interested. Essentially, you could, you know, talk to their youth services person and decide on the ages or how you want to do signups and set certain dates where you guys would mail the letters back and forth. It could be something like a program where everybody comes and writes the letters and then you send it off or you could tell them we're sending off the letters on this date, drop it off at the library and you could create these pen pals from a different area with these children, which could be something really fun for them. A couple more program ideas. There's a lot of cryptography in the manual, a lot of things about um, different codes or ways of communication like Morse code, pig pen, that kind of thing. So you could do a really fun program where you teach them different types of coding and communication, the history of Morse code, and maybe a cheat sheet. And then you could provide them with beads and they can make their own Morse code bracelets, whether it's their name or it's a special message. And they can learn about different forms of communication. It's a really fun thing that you could do with them to teach them about something they might not necessarily have learned before. And one of my favorite um, things that I've put in here, it's not necessarily a program on its own, but it, it's a great tie-in, especially if you do a camping type program, is a take and make s'more station. You can lay out a table with different graham cracker, marshmallow, and chocolate options with a goodie bag, and they can make their own little s'more mix. Now, if you don't want them necessarily scooping it themselves with their hands, you can have a colleague helping them and do that for them. Um, you can provide, you know, Teddy Grahams, graham crackers, golden grams, marshmallows, uh, different kinds of marshmallows or Lucky Charms, and different kinds of chocolate like Hershey's or M&M's, even Reese Puffs may be good if you have the peanut butter ones, you know, separate. Um, and it's, it could be a fun thing for them to just kind of make their own s'more mix. And just as a reminder that if you do it as a take and mix station and you remove the food from the original packaging that you either want to save that package or take photos of it so that somebody with a dietary restriction can check those ingredients. Uh, you just always kind of want to have that in the back of your mind if you do anything with food. Next up, we have passive programming. Just a couple ideas for things you can do throughout the library, things that you could do one time or kind of change it out weekly, bi-weekly, however you choose to do that. So first we have a bird watch quest. This is from the manual. They provided pictures of birds with the QR code. And when you scan it, you can listen to the birds calls that they make. It's adorable. And you can put them up all over the library for them to kind of hunt for. Or you can do one a week where they can come in and see what the new bird and the new sound is. And you can include maybe like a field journal or something for them to write facts in about that bird. Um, if you have any kind of bird watching books you can put out with it, they can research what that bird is and learn a little bit more about it or where it's from. So that's a really cute idea you can do. You could spread it out or do it all at once. It's up to you. Another thing you could do is a library passport and you can provide them with passports, many versions of passports that you can get off of Amazon or little journals. And you can do either stickers or stamps with it. And you can do a weekly library challenge for them to earn those stamps or stickers. So maybe one week it's searching for a book in a catalog, in the catalog, or attending a program or checking out a book, that kind of thing. If you have more than one library branch, maybe each branch has its own unique sticker or stamp, and they have to go to all the different branches to collect all the different ones. It's one that's definitely, it's self-guided and it's not required but it's a great way to showcase different aspects of your library, encourage people to try things that they haven't necessarily done before. If you know particularly that there's a lot of questions you get, I know here often we get the question, how do you use the online catalog? So that's one that we would absolutely do. And it kind of encourages them to use different things. If you have a maker space or if you have a library of things, that kind of thing, it's a great way to show different things that they don't necessarily know that you have to offer. And it's a great incentive to encourage them if they get a unique stamp or sticker in their little booklet. 
Then we have suitcase packing. This one's kind of geared towards the younger kids to teach them a sense of responsibility and independence. You can provide a laminated picture of a suitcase and some different packing items like a sun hat or hiking boots, a scarf, some goggles. And then you can provide a destination, you know, if it's the beach or Disney World or that kind of thing. And the suitcase has to be packed based on the location. So you could put little Velcro dots on all the items and let them pack the suitcase. Um, if you choose to use real items, that's up to you as well. The parents would probably love this as a way to kind of encourage the kids how to pack for themselves. You know, if we're going to the beach, we don't necessarily need the ski boots. It's a great way for them to kind of use context clues. And you can change it weekly. You can also just have all of the items and different prompts for them to work through. You know, you just did the beach. Now let's do camping in the mountains, that kind of thing. And it's just a great way for them to kind of think about what they would pack. Now, this passive program is one that you can incorporate into your social media presence online. So you would use your library mascot. And if you don't have a mascot, you could choose a stuffed animal that represents your library. And you would take a picture and attach it to a popsicle stick. And you would create a hashtag for your program. We did something like this last year with our gator mascot, Gertie. So Gertie had her own hashtag. And you would let patrons take this popsicle stick, you would make multiple and just give them away. And they would take them on their travels, whether they just are going around town or they're going out of the state and let them post it to social media, tag your library and use that hashtag. And you're getting interactions online and people are, you know, taking pictures of your mascot at Dollywood, that kind of thing. And you're getting notices and you're getting your social media attention. Alternatively, you could do this with your own social media, take the photo around town and ask people online where they think it was photographed. If you have it propped up, you know, at a coffee shop, people are commenting, saying where it is. It's a great way to get interactions online. And it's a great way to kind of get people to notice or pay attention. And it's just a great way for them to come together and say, oh, I know that spot. That's the local museum or whatever you choose to do. You can also partner with a local business and have that picture propped up in the business or maybe the actual mascot itself for people to find and take a picture of and share online. You know, it was found in the bookstore. Uh, just make sure you're asking that business before you do that kind of thing. And then we have a couple incentive ideas. If you're doing any kind of reward-based programming um, for reading a book, doing this, this kind of thing. Um, a couple ideas for incentives you can use with this age group is a canvas tote bag. We all love a good book tote bag. Who hasn't hoarded them? Library workers always seem to end up with a bunch of them. We love them. And multiple ages really love having these kinds of bags. So you could give them the bag and then they have to earn these iron on patches and they can decorate it however they want. Maybe it's in a particular program where you're playing games and every time you win, you earn a patch. And then at the end, we'll put the patches on it or that kind of thing. And the other one is these silicone charm bracelets. These are rubber charm bracelets with holes in them and they put them on and the pop in charms are very similar to the croc shoe charms. And it's kind of the same thing. They get the bracelet and then they can earn the charms. And these charms and patches come in every interest, hobby, sport, and character you can possibly think of. You can get them in bulk for really cheap. And these kids will absolutely do anything to earn that patch or that charm that they really want. So these are just a couple ideas for ways to encourage that kind of particip participation. Uh, it, it's just really cute and they would love to do either one of these. Next up, we have a couple craft ideas for you here. Um, you can do fairy doors. This is really cute. It ties into the adventure theme when you think about doors and the places you can go. And it's good for any age because younger kids would still probably like to play with the doors and older kids might just display them or put them on their bookshelves. And you don't necessarily have to buy fairy doors. 
you can, if you have a maker space, you can make them. You can also do a very low cost and make them out of cardboard and cereal boxes, that kind of thing. There's a lot of ways for you to do it where it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. And it's something super cute that anybody would love to do. And then you can do photo frames or cork boards, really anything for collecting memories. You can do journals, scrapbooks, photo albums, that kind of thing. The photo frame is really simple. You could make it out of something as easy as popsicle sticks with buttons, letter beads, glitter, or cork boards, just little simple ribbons or things you can put on there. And these are great to do any time of the summer because if you do it in the beginning, then they have something to put their memories on throughout the summer. And if you do it at the end of the summer, then they probably already have some photos or some memories that they want to put on there. So it's great for you to do at any given time. And it doesn't necessarily cost a whole lot of money to do that kind of craft. Next, you can do nature impressions. This is just where you take model clay or air dry clay and you let them form it into a ball. And you can give them things to impress in it, whether it's a leaf or a flower, maybe it's a seashell, or maybe it's a plastic animal from the dollar store, that kind of thing. And they can just make their own little stone that they have created a shape on. You can also do terrariums. Again, you can get most of this stuff at the dollar store for very cheap, whether you use a mason jar or a plastic bowl, and you can do any kind of terrarium that you want to do whether that's dinosaurs or space or underwater or a fairy tale theme, you can make it your own or you can give them as many options to make it however they want to do it. You can also do bird feeders or bird houses. There's a lot of bird-based programming in this. It's really encouraging them to go outdoors. This is a fun one you can do, again, using popsicle sticks, something very cheap. Um, it's something that they really, anybody loves making this kind of thing because it always makes a great gift for maybe the grandparents in their lives or whoever they want to give it to, or it's just something that they can take home and they can watch for birds. It's something that they would love to do and then take home. Then we have a couple grab and go ideas for you guys. Um, so something you can do is I have provided a resource for a road list, a road trip checklist and games. The games kind of include like road sign bingo um, and a checklist for different places that you may be going. Things that will be fun for a car trip for a big family. Also similar to Mad Libs, something that a big group of people can do together. You could also put together some information about local cryptids or folklore, or maybe if you don't have any local cryptid history, uh, you could just do Bigfoot and do some fun information, some things that they can learn about. And you can also, again, you can do cryptography. This goes back to the Morse code, the pig pen, uh, the phonetic coding. You could do a grab and go for one specific code history, how to do it, cheat sheet, or you could put a couple together and they can learn something from it. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can put together that type of program, uh, that type of grab and go. And another language is sign language learning sheets. We've never had a time where we put out sign language sheets and somebody hasn't come back and shown us that they've learned it. It's very easy to pick up the simple things, alphabet, numbers, basic phrases. And it's a great skill that they could pick up on and something that hopefully they would retain. So it's just great things for them to take with them and learn about. And another thing you can do is around the world grab and goes. You can set up a table and you can change it out weekly and change the country or you could do a couple different countries and put all the information out at once. It's really up to you. Um, and whatever country you put out, you can include books that are related to that country and then maybe a recipe or some fun facts, coloring sheets, uh, specific landmarks or things in that country. Um, and then they could kind of learn about it. And you could provide a passport for it to be stamped weekly for that certain country. If they come and pick up the grab and go, they travel to that country. If you don't want to do passports, you can also do um, a special sticker in each grab and go that they can take. You know, if you do France, then they get an Eiffel Tower sticker, that kind of thing. Um, it's a great way to kind of 
teach them about other cultures or maybe make them feel like they've traveled when they haven't necessarily traveled or maybe would never go to one of these countries. It's just a great way for them to learn about another culture. And it's something you could do a couple countries. Like I said, you could change it out weekly. However much effort you really want to put into it is up to you, but it's a fun way for them to kind of get an idea of traveling. And as always, at the end of your programs, you want to do an, an evaluation, work in some time at the end to talk to children and caregivers about the program, um, what programs maybe they want to see at the library. And you always want to evaluate your own program at the end and ask yourself what went wrong, what went right, you know, um, did the sound not work out properly, that kind of thing. And you ultimately, you know what you want to do better the next time. And then at the end of it, you just kind of, you move on and you're very proud of yourself for the work that you did because you did do a good job. And then you go on to the next thing and you do an even better job the next time. Finally, we're going to talk about book lists. So I've put together a couple books for you for these age ranges and maybe a couple ideas that you can add in to with these books. So I have my heart is a compass and it's really cute. It's got these illustrations that are so sweet and it talks about different tools um, like a compass and different items or sections of a map. And it's kind of, it teaches you how to use these things while also still being a story. It's very nice. We also have constellations for kids. This is a very basic and brief explanation to astronomy. It's got the stories of the stars. It's very easy to follow. Um, kids would love it, especially if you're doing an astronomy program or any kind of astronomy-based passive programming, if you have telescopes, that kind of thing. It's a great little book to teach them a kind of a little bit of everything when it comes to the stars. Next, we have Listen. This one kind of is a mindful book. It's got these cute illustrations and encourages slowing down, closing your eyes, and kind of listening to the world around you. It's got a lot of onomatopoeias in it. Um, it's kind of just great for encouraging. Let's take a walk outside and listen for things we haven't heard before. Let's hear the sounds of our city. Uh, it's a great book to encourage just kind of going outside and discovering something you haven't before. Then we have Show the World. This is a young photographer seeing different places, and it shows the different ways that you can express yourself, whether it's through athleticism or photography or music, that kind of thing. It just kind of encourages kids to have different creative outlets or to, to see what kind of creative outlets you can have. Next, we have some books for third through fifth grade. We have What If? Then we, this is great for imagination. It's great for those kids who always ask why. Um, and it's a good tool to use for your own prompts. You know, this goes back to like the icebreaker questions. What if this happened? Then this happened. And it's basically these two characters going back and forth. What if we got lost in a foreign land? Then we became great adventurers. And it, it's so, so cute. It's great to build on imagination. I absolutely adore this book. And then we have Where We Live, Mapping Neighborhoods of Kids Around the Globe. This goes back to learning about other cultures and goes back to maps. It's a great way to kind of teach different backgrounds and show diversity. It's got cute little illustrations showing kids' lives from all over the world. And it, it could go into any book display, really, that you would choose to do. Then we have Amazing Landmarks, Discover the Hidden Stories Behind 10 Iconic Structures. These are from all over the world, and there's also a potential program in this to do building these landmarks out of Play-Doh or Legos, that kind of thing. So there's some fun in there that you could do um, and kind of goes into travel, and you can still build a program out of just that, whether it's passive or it's a program in person. There's a lot of fun things you can do. Then we have the Timekeeper series. These are young chapter books. Um, they're history based on different events. These kids go back in time to different events and experience the first flight or the ancient Olympics. 
And it's a great historical fiction, kind of gets them into history or learning about different aspects of history. It's very easy to follow for younger kids. Uh, so it's just a great option. Then we have a couple books for all ages. They would be good for any age group, any programming, anything that you might do. You have the amazing, the Atlas of Amazing Birds, great little illustrations. If you're doing any of these bird programs, this is a great one to have for them to follow along, maybe learn about a different bird. Um, so that is, it's just adorable. And it's kind of a kid's version of learning about different birds. There's Making Your Own Maps. This one teaches the basics of what's on a map and it ties into travel. You can kind of encourage like, you know, do a map of your neighborhood, do a map from your house to the library, that kind of thing. And then one of my favorite kids books that I always encourage everyone to read is Maybe. This book has such beautiful illustrations. It sparks the imagination. Maybe you'll do this or maybe you'll do that. And it kind of gives you all the possibilities of things that you can do. And it's so gorgeous, no matter the age range, it's very encouraging. Whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna be great at it. So I always love this book. I always love reading it or giving giving it as a, a, an option for people. It's just a fantastic book to have in your collection. So with that being said, we have done it, everyone. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. I hope you all have a wonderful summer full of adventure. Thank you to my library system for providing me the tools to do this. And thank you to MLC, as always, for having me. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Follow us on TikTok. Do whatever. I hope your summers are wonderful, magical. Thank you so much. Goodbye and good luck.